Good evening. Welcome to our midweek Wednesday night service. Um, once again, we'll be doing Holden Evening Prayer. Did everybody get their booklet or the, the screen is on? It's just on blank right now. Um, and um, tonight for our service, uh, again, we're looking at people kind of surrounding the uh, crucifixion of Jesus. And tonight we'll be hearing some scripture and a little bit about Judas Iscariot. Um, so I'm going to see, I gave Matt the remote, so we're going to see if it'll work from back there. Um, and if you want to, oh, and you know what, hang on, it probably won't work. All right, yeah, just go down one and see if you can run it from back there. Did it go down? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, I will not touch anything else and hopefully it'll keep going. All right, Kathy, whenever you're ready. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now for it is evening. And the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness. Shine within you, your people here. Joyous light of heavenly glory, loving glow of God's own face. You who sing creation story, shine on.
May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence surround and fill us so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Our first reading for this evening comes from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of St. John. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it into the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, do quickly what you are going to do. Our second reading comes from the gospel of Matthew, the 27th chapter. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. Have you ever noticed how many feelings people have about me, but how little is actually written about me? 
unlike Peter and Andrew, James and John or many others, there is no story of Judas Iscariot meets Jesus. No one mentioned my job like they did Matthew's. I don't ask very many questions of Jesus like Thomas. And I pretty much kept to myself until the news came of my betrayal. If you think about it, you pretty much know my father's name is Simon and that I brought the soldiers to arrest Jesus. John calls me a thief, but he's the only one. Luke and John attribute my actions to Satan, but Matthew and Mark don't. I have one of the largest roles in delivering Jesus up to his crucifixion, and yet you know next to nothing about me. In fact, you only really know the worst of me. And I'm not here to change that. Apparently, my life before the week of Passover is really not all that important. I mean, would it garner any sympathy from you if I told you that some people thought my father was once a Pharisee who caught leprosy? Which you can imagine what that did to our family status and name. Would you hate me more? if you knew that some people thought Iscariot was not a place or a name so much as a designation, that I belonged to the most violent, rebellious sect of the Jewish community. You thought Simon was the zealot. In all honesty, could your feelings or thoughts about my actions or my consequences be swayed with a tidbit of information after this many years. I doubt it. So I'm not going to try. I made mistakes and I admitted them. But haven't we all been there? What I will tell you is that I was dissatisfied with Jesus. That's really what it boils down to. I had other expectations of a Messiah a savior, whatever you want to call it. And I'm telling you that I did really believe in Jesus at first. I couldn't ignore that there was something special about him, that God was working through him. When I could come up with no explanations for his miracles, for his way of being, for that confidence in who he was, I knew I had to follow him. I didn't plan on betraying him. And I certainly never thought of it that way or thought that Satan was responsible. I'd like to think that I didn't honestly know that turning him over to the chief priests would result in his death. But I can't be totally sure on that. What I can tell you is that I never felt unfaithful to God in what I was doing. Dissatisfaction and despair are very different things. And I never lost hope in God. I lost confidence in Jesus. I kept waiting for the more. That's the dissatisfaction. I kept waiting for more. After three years of traveling and teaching and miracles, I thought something else would happen. Where was the power and the awe of a son of God? Even the miracles became commonplace in their way. Go to town, teach the people, heal someone, have an argument, and leave. It was becoming routine. And I knew the leaders of the temple were worried about his following. I knew they were unhappy and skeptical. I heard the rumblings, and I knew that in going to them, I was going to make something happen. 
And perhaps there lies my greatest downfall, trying to force something to happen. Either Jesus was going to step it up and finally prove what he could do. Or the chief priests would get their way and we would know that Jesus isn't who he thought he was. Who we thought he was. Turns out it wasn't an or, but an and. I just had no idea that Jesus was going to reveal himself in being willing to die. And that the chief priests would get their way in killing him. Romans don't just kill anyone. And I kind of got stuck in the middle. I had helped send Jesus to his death, but I did not want to send Jesus to his death. I just wanted more. I wanted to be satisfied in my time and my way. You may have never betrayed the son of God, but did you ever want to push for something to happen? For an answer to be revealed? For God to step it up or prove something to you in your time and in your way? I was too rash toward Jesus, I'll admit it. But maybe history's been a little too harsh toward me. And maybe we can still learn from each other. For instance, as little as they talk about my life, did you know there's also conversation around my death? John says, I returned the money and hung myself. But Peter proclaimed that I bought the field with the money and fell on it, bursting open. Thank you very much, Peter. Neither one is a pretty end. Neither one offers me redemption or forgiveness. But neither one really gives my whole story of life or death. So I'll remain a mystery, not much known but my betrayal. But I learned one thing that is not a mystery. Jesus died for all, even me. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. An angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said, to her rejoice so highly favored for God is with you you shall bear a child and his name shall be Jesus the chosen one of God most high and Mary said servant of my God, I live to do your will. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with long 
peace and peace we pray to Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our God, praise and thanks to you. May God, creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the spirit of love be our guide and path for all. Before we go in peace, I do want to remind you we will have service next week. I will be out of town with the kids on spring break, but Pastor Matt is going to lead um, worship. So we will have service next Wednesday, uh, 7 p.m. Let us go in peace. Thanks be to God. <laughs>